and perhaps worse, no heart to fight the Japanese. The Japanese Navy now rules the waters off China's coast. When the southern city of Canton falls, it becomes almost impossible to ship military equipment and supplies by sea into free China. Chiang Kai-shek's major lifeline is severed. Capitulation seems inevitable. Virtually every battle now ends in defeat for Chiang Kai-shek's forces. And the Japanese, a million and a half strong, are pushing up the Yangtze River, expecting Chiang's surrender at any moment. But he believes the Americans and the British will have to join him in battling the Japanese. It is only a matter of time. If only he can hold out. Never using the term retreat, but rather redeployment, he decides to move the industrial strength of China west, beyond the mountains, beyond the last railway lines, beyond the lines of communication, beyond the reach of the Japanese. Space for time. Scorch the earth. Space for time. Blow up the factory building. Leave nothing for the invaders. It is one of the greatest mass migrations in the history of the world. 30 million people pull up stakes and move westward. Chiang Kai-shek moves to a new temporary capital in the mountainous city of Chongqing in western China. Chongqing is virtually inaccessible, connected to the outside world by a treacherous river route, a few winding trails, and by air. To the outside world, Chongqing becomes a romantic symbol of a politically united, all-inclusive and optimistic China, ready to resist the Japanese invaders. But it is a genuinely dismal city, bursting at the seams with refugees. It is totally lacking in grace, totally without distinction, except now it is the Generalissimo's capital. For nine months of the year, the mountain stronghold is darkened by heavy mist. May arrives and the rainy season ends. The blistering sun and stifling heat return. And for the first time, the citizens of Chongqing see their sky filled with Japanese warplanes. Bombings begin in early spring of 1939. The Japanese strike with impunity. The citizens have no shelter, and there are no anti-aircraft guns. The refugees' flimsy shacks made of bamboo mats burn like paper. But soon the cliffs will be honeycombed with cave shelters. Chongqing is becoming more than an embattled city. It is becoming a symbol of defiance. As is Madame Chiang Kai-shek, who after her jeep is strafed, is spoken of as China's Joan of Arc. Mei Ling works tirelessly, setting up hospitals and orphanages. After months of living in the acrid atmosphere of embattled Chongqing, and on her doctor's orders, she goes to Hong Kong for rest, recuperation, and a surprising reunion. Patrons of the exclusive Hong Kong Hotel restaurant can't believe their eyes. The last time the Sung sisters had appeared together in public was more than 10 years ago. It is as if they set aside their political differences. The Sung sisters are creating their own united front. Mei Ling wants her sisters to be by her side in Chongqing. They agree. In a great public relations exercise, they set out to generate interest in China among the American people. And it works. They make headlines in the American press. In 1940, the first politically friendly appearance made by the sisters after 1927 was 
the joint trip from Hong Kong to Chongqing. This was also under special circumstances because there was a danger at that time of capitulation, of surrender by China to the Japanese. The threat comes from quizzling Chinese leaders who are preparing to work out a secret alliance with the Japanese. All three Sung sisters are determined not to let that happen. This was a gesture of unity at a time when it was very necessary not to split up the second united front in China. These sisters, they welcomed the opportunity to be together because after all they'd grown up together and so forth. They were separated by politics. At this time politics made it possible for them to be together. Although they show a united front, Sun Qingling continues to feed Western reporters scandalous gossip on the goings-on of her sister's husbands. They represented as a corrupt regime. So there was that difference between the sisters. One sister on one side and two sisters on the other. Having performed her sisterly duties, Qingling prepares to return to Hong Kong and exile. But this time, her separation from her sisters will be short-lived. Without warning, as they have always struck, they struck again. According to all the rules, China's position should now be greatly improved. For in her war with Japan, China now had fighting allies. Ourselves, the British, the Dutch. Having the Allies join the fight does not stop the Japanese advances. British forces collapse in Hong Kong. Singapore falls. And then, the ultimate disaster for China. The British are driven out of Burma. And with their retreat, the last overland supply route from the west to Chiang Kai-shek's troops is severed. The Burma Road is closed. Chiang Kai-shek's China is cut off. Washington responds to the plea for help by sending a defeated politician on a fact-finding mission to embattle China. Wilkie was on a political visit. He was going to run for president. Two years earlier, in 1940, Wendell Wilkie was defeated by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The next election is just two years away. His interest was to appear presidential and a master of man in the Chinese setting with the eye on the American public. The value of having support of the American public is readily evident as a $500 million loan for China swiftly gets congressional approval. She understood all of these things very well because she was bicultural, really. Uh, the most bicultural of the sisters. So she proceeded to charm Mr. Wilkie, and he reacted favorably to, to her blandishments. So uh, she was very effective. Wilkie even invited her to accompany him back to the United States on his airplane in front of the Generalissimo, which seemed to us to be rather tactless. There was a demonstration of, of her utility to the Generalissimo. Was captivating, uh, visiting American dignitaries could, because she understood them very well, spoke fluent English, uh, and was a very good-looking woman. 
Another Sung sister, who some consider to be even more attractive, Sung Ching Ling is back in Chongqing after narrowly escaping capture in Hong Kong by the swiftly advancing Japanese. She lives in Chongqing in a gilded but carefully watched cage. She had her own little house, comfortable middle class house. She lived a very circumscribed existence. She was regarded as hostile to the Generalissimo, which she was. I don't think that her servants were uh, agents uh, of the uh, of John Krajicek's secret police. Uh, however, her house was watched. At least she believed that it was watched. My job was to guard the house and deliver Sun Qinlin's letters. Chinli's office was here. During the day, she usually read newspapers and met people. If she had a little time off after dinner, she would go to her room and I could hear the sound of the typewriter tapping through the night. Sung Ching Ling's house becomes a mecca for American journalists and young American diplomats looking for southern hospitality and fine southern cooking, a talent she picked up many years ago while studying in Macon, Georgia. Among the regular visitors to her house is a young American diplomat, John Service. It's a very dignified and elegant, very moderate house arrest. She was watched, but anybody that knew her was also watched. Anybody that had contact was uh, put down in the book. The biggest worry for Chiang Kai-shek's secret police is the communists who work openly in Chongqing especially the urbane Chou Enlai, the communist senior representative in the United Front. Whatever I heard from Zhou Enlai's office, I would hear the same thing at Madame Sun's office, or Sun's drawing room, having tea with her. There was usually very little difference. Uh, she supported uh, the line that was taken by the Chinese communists as far as I could see without any essential difference. But one ally and friend of Sun Qingling is certainly no communist, known admiringly by his troops as Vinegar Joe, General Joe Stilwell, senior American officer, is in charge of China operations. He is a blunt, impatient West Pointer who speaks Chinese and who is constantly agitated with the stalling and evasions of Chiang Kai-shek. Zhang was a terrible strategist because he uh, was indecisive. That was characteristic of him. That's what bothered Stilwell so, was that Zhang would issue a great order or a command, and then he'd change it. And this was made it very, very difficult to deal with. Chiang Kai-shek, never really trusting his Chinese communist allies, keeps his best troops out of any real fighting, holding them in reserve, ready to encircle the communists. The long-term goal for Jiang Kai-shek was the preservation of his own power. And that meant the elimination of the communists. We had different objectives. We were fighting a different war. And I don't think there was any hope of real cooperation on the basis that the United States wanted. The United States uh, wanted a, a, an all-out really serious, uh, go for broke sort of war against Japan. And the Chinese were saying, take it easy, you know. <laughs> the communist forces of the United Front are not taking it easy. They are fighting the Japanese. But then for reasons unknown, Chiang Kai-shek's forces turn on their United Front allies and destroy a detachment of the communist army. In Chiang Kai-shek's view, the Japanese are an affliction of the skin. 
The communists are a disease of the heart. It's a view that two of the Sung sisters share, but not Sung Ching Ling. She worries that this negative view of the communists is the only one reaching the American public. She wanted to go to the United States. And she would never ask for the United States to take the side of the communists against the Gomindang. But she certainly would ask them not to take the side of the Gomindang in civil war against the communists. I think if you asked her what she wanted to say, well, all she wanted to say was the truth about China. The truth about China was that the people in the North were fighting very effectively and very hard and deserved help and deserved recognition. And that Jiang Kai-shek was not fighting the war very well. The Jiang family would not allow her to go and express the United Front point of view, or which they point of view. It would be a competition between uh, the two parties, and they weren't about to let that happen. Instead, Mei Ling prepares to go and woo the politicians and the people of the United States in a campaign the likes of which America has never seen. Madam Chiang Kai-shek, First Lady of China, is welcomed to Washington by Mrs. Roosevelt. Her momentous meeting with the president is her first public appearance in the United States. She received a huge media-inspired welcome. It was a great news story, and American public gets whipped up by the media, as you know. And uh, she is a very dramatic person, and she utilized every opportunity to dramatize herself. A guest of the White House during her stay in the Capitol, the Chinese Joan of Arc has a busy calendar. Senators, lawmakers are eager to shake her hand. A tremendous ovation marks her dramatic appearance before the House of Representatives. Here, American-educated Madam Chiang Kai-shek, called the most powerful woman in the world, addresses the elected representatives of the American people. is eager and ready to cooperate with you and other peoples to lay a true and lasting foundation for a sane and progressive world society which would make it impossible for any arrogant or predatory neighbor to plunge future generations into another orgy of blood. Wherever she appears, she bedazzles the politicians and blinds them to her husband's true character. The generalissimo, as far as the American public was concerned, was a great stone face. Whereas, on the other hand, Madame Zhang created an empathy, good reaction on the part of the general public, who really only saw her in pictures and in news events. So uh, she did seem to be a tremendous power. Americans have never seen anything quite like this. Part royal tour, part religious crusade, part presidential campaign, and part circus. We're now entering the ballroom where in the early 40s, Madam Chiang Kai-shek hosted a reception for the United States President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This party was attended by all of the diplomatic corps, the ambassadors and, the, and their wives, and the cream of Washington society. And uh, since the hotel's been open, this event drew the largest attendance of any function that's ever taken place in the hotel. The line went from the receiving line at the foot of the steps, all the way up the ballroom stairs, out through this entire lobby, out through Calvert Street. Traffic was tied up all over this area, even more than any inaugurals. New York City gives Madame Chung her first big public welcome to America. Thousands gathering at City Hall to cheer the American educated woman who has pledged with her husband to lead China to victory. <laughs> From City Hall, she visits New York's famous Chinatown, just a few blocks away. Future generations of Chinese will be told for many years to come of the day Madame Chiang Kai-shek rode through the streets of New York and won the heart of all America with her courage and her charm. My most vivid memory of Madame Chiang was at Madison Square Garden 
And she, of course, didn't turn up, and didn't turn up, and didn't turn up. And we were all pacing around, looking at our watches, saying unmentionable things about Madame Chang, who finally, at the very last moment, when everyone was in, in uh, having a fit, she did arrive. She was well known for having very royal attitudes to the peasantry of uh, America, where, of course, she was educated. Every public event, including her return visit to her alma mater, is carefully orchestrated to leave a positive impression of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, and, by extension, China. Madame Jiang has already gotten a reputation for being uh, uh, pulling the strings, and they wanted to diminish that, and that, that she's really the leader of women, and therefore a leader of democracy. Uh, we're trying to put the best front we can on the situation. Putting the best front forward is what the people in the dream factory of America do best. Huge throngs pack Hollywood's famous bowl to see and hear Madame Chiang Kai-shek and Mary Pickford head a roster of cinema celebrities here to welcome China's First Lady. The message is clear. If such a modern, sophisticated and powerful woman as Madame Chiang Kai-shek can emerge from China, then China must certainly be worth American support and money. Madame Chiang makes a dramatic plea for the peoples of the world. We shall not permit aggression to raise its satanic head and threaten man's greatest heritage life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all peoples. Far from the Hollywood image machine, in a small church in Upper New York State, Madame Chiang Kai-shek's image is literally transformed into a religious icon. its newest secular saint. Donations begin to flood in. start flowing out of Washington and into the black hole of Chongqing. Meiling's brother becomes a permanent fixture on Capitol Hill. TV soon was maneuvering great quantities of cash back to China and things disappeared. Munitions disappeared. On the other side of the Himalayas in India, American supplies are starting to flow in. The faucet of aid is turned on. Americans, however, are totally unaware of just how little of this will actually trickle down to troops fighting the Japanese. From fields in India, an air transport command plane takes off every six minutes, loaded with artillery, jeeps, ammunition, men and supplies for the armies of China. Over this Burma Skyway, over this hump of mountains 16,000 feet high, more tonnage is being flown into China than was ever trucked in over the old Burma Road. And in the skies over China, Japan faces new opposition. And to the aid of China came volunteers from other lands, men who pledged themselves to fight against tyranny and oppression no matter where. Americans like the legendary Colonel Chenault and his Flying Tigers, who with their few American planes were knocking down enemy planes at the fantastic ratio of 20 nips to one of their own. But General Stilwell, in charge of ground forces, is frustrated and furious with Chiang Kai-shek's refusal to send his troops into battle. In his diaries, he describes the Generalissimo as the little rattlesnake and contemptuously refers to him as Peanut. Chung King, 
instead of being a command center for the fight against the Japanese, is turning into a cesspool of graft and corruption. Hoarding for future eventualities becomes the order of the day. Then the rumors begin to swirl around Chongqing about the Kung family, particularly about one of the Sung sisters, Madame Kung. Stories about Madame Kung are mostly about uh, money, about uh, corruption, about inside deals, about knowing when to put money into this or that. And also for, for getting favors from people wanting to do business with the government, things like that. I heard about it at the time, of course. H.H. Kuhn would drop a few words, and the next day, the prices would shoot up. But Sung Ailin would have bought before that, and would sell when prices rose. There were great quantities of money involved, and uh, it's hard to keep secrets when big sums like that are moving around. In public, Sun Ching Ling says nothing, but in private, she confides that she is troubled about her sister. She was critical of her for wanting too much, for being greedy. Madame Zhang wanted the power, and Madame Kong wanted the money. At least that was the popular saying, and I think Madame Sun was quite pleased by that. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chiang observe the beginning of China's seventh year of war against Japanese aggression. On behalf of President Roosevelt, General Stilwell presents the Generalissimo with the Legion of Merit, America's highest decoration to a foreign military leader. We were having plenty of troubles with China and Stilwell and Chiang Kai-shek. Certainly we had reports of corruption. We knew that uh, there were corruption in high places. But at the same time, uh, they were fighting, they were trying, they were an ally, and we don't inform our public uh, officially of all the bad things about the Allies. The Allies come together in Cairo. It is a great public relations exercise, as if four great world leaders have come together. It is a short conference, which concludes with an agreement that after the war, Japan must return all territory seized from China. All conversations must be funneled through Mei Ling. The, the question that always existed was, is Madame Zhang, when she's translating, is she translating accurately what the Generalissimo says, or is she saying what she thinks should be? We, we know that in some cases she changed uh, what he was saying. But it is President Roosevelt who changes what he was saying in Cairo. In a meeting a week later, Roosevelt capitulates when Stalin demands that the agreement with China be revoked. No one bothers to tell Chiang Kai-shek. There is also trouble on the home front at the Chang's Chungking home, known as the Eagle's Nest, Madame Chiang Kai-shek is reported to have flown the coop to stay with her sister. She did not tolerate concubines. And there was rumored to be uh, a, a rift between the two over his uh, fancying, uh, and perhaps more than fancying, uh, a young woman. Chongqing in China, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek meets Henry Wallace, Vice President of the United States, here as the personal representative. Henry Wallace is here to try to salvage the rapidly deteriorating relations between Chiang Kai-shek and General Stilwell. Little does Wallace know, that he is also stepping into a domestic dispute that all of Chongqing is talking about. Zhang proposes a toast to the victory of the United Nations. The room is seething with secret agendas and hidden emotions. Wallace has come to the conclusion that Chiang Kai-shek is no longer capable of running the country. 
Chiang Kai-shek sees an opportunity to pressure the U.S. in getting rid of his nemesis, General Stilwell. Madam Chiang Kai-shek is burning with Methodist rage at her husband's latest indiscretion. While Ching Ling wishes she could be anywhere else but here, sitting beside the man she despises. It seems most people would rather be somewhere else other than at this dinner. Everybody enjoyed telling these stories that uh, he had sort of taken a mistress. And it was interesting, just as a sort of a political fact, that everybody gave credence to them, but everybody enjoyed them. And so, uh, Jiang Kai-shek and Sung Mei Ling finally called a mission, uh, a meeting of foreign missionaries, since they were both Christians, I think they thought this would be effective, to deny these stories, you see, and to say that they weren't going to split up, that they were getting along. But within a few weeks, another announcement. Mei Ling wanted to get away, and Mei Ling and Ai Ling took off for Brazil. Well, it's bizarre, the whole thing. Uh, uh, but that's the way things were. Shortly thereafter, another resident of Chongqing is packing bags. General Stilwell is told by the President of the United States to return home. Angry and resentful that Chiang Kai-shek managed to get one of America's favorite generals dismissed, the heavily censored press corps in Chongqing turns on the Generalissimo. Correspondence of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, authoritarian dictator, uh, uh, proto-fascist, not fascist, but um, certainly not democratic in any way. And uh, so that they became much more, uh, much more open to the, to the uh, communist position. For the first time, Travel into communist-held territory is permitted for American journalists and diplomats. Their enthusiastic reports are full of glowing tales of idealism, integrity, and self-sacrifice. Of an army that has drive, discipline, and motivation. Everything that seems to be missing in the corrupt and decadent wartime capital of Chongqing. Then, suddenly, two atom bombs end the war with Japan. With the surrender of Japan, Mao Zedong, as head of the Chinese communists, flies down to negotiate with Chiang Kai-shek. But the Generalissimo has an ace up his sleeve, a secret agreement of support from another communist leader. Stalin was a very realistic man. In, if the revolution was moving forward, he would support it. If he had no confidence that it would go forward, he still had the problem of relations with China, state uh, to state. Chiang Kai-shek returns victorious to Shanghai, and with him come his officials, with the corrupt practices they mastered in the seven years of exile in Chongqing. As Chiang Kai-shek and Mei Ling pay their respects at the Sung family graveside, they are unaware of the hoarding, the corruption, the alliances with gangsters and odious traitors that quickly alienate the people who are under nationalist control. The inevitable finally happens. Full-out civil war. Over the months, the civil war increases in violence. Chiang Kai-shek is kept in the dark. The worse it becomes, the less he is told. The communists call it a war of liberation. Americans don't know what to call it. With inflation going out of control in China, Mei Ling travels once again to Washington on a begging mission. This time her reception is very different from earlier visits. President Truman is in no mood to give any more handouts. He pointedly does not invite her to stay at the White House. Instead, he publicly announces that America has given enough money to China, $3.8 billion. And privately, 
he orders the CIA and the FBI to investigate just what did happen to all that money. Meiling's trip proves to be a disaster. So is Chiang Kai-shek's war against the communists. Everywhere. Almost a million of his troops desert to the communist side. Those who remain loyal to him prepare to leave Chinese soil and start anew on the island of Formosa. Finally, in the fall of 1949, the communists can claim victory. The People's Republic of China is born. Almost 30 years earlier, Sun Qingling was the first lady of China's first republic. Today, Mao Zedong is declared its first chairman, a position of authority. Madam Sun Yat-sen is elected vice chairman of the republic, a position of honor. As widow of the father of New China, she is given an honored place just behind Mao Zedong as he declares atop the gate of heavenly peace that China has finally stood up. When the newsreel footage is seen by the Sung family, they can pick out the last sister left in China. They ended in opposite camps. Sung Ching Ling always understood that, and they understood that. In 1949, uh, her sister, uh, Sung Mei Ling, was de declared to be uh, a war criminal in the civil war. Together with Jiang Kai-shek, she didn't protest. Soon Ching Ling returns to her new home in Shanghai. She also returns to a role that she's played since her marriage to Dr. Sun Yat-sen so many years earlier, that of a symbol. She devotes her time to women's welfare and to children's education. She also becomes a kind of roving ambassador for world peace. <laughs> She pops up as the Chinese representative at various third world peace conferences. It is the height of the Cold War and the McCarthy witch hunts. America is looking for those guilty of losing China. Meanwhile, FBI files on Sun Ching Ling just keep getting thicker. At one point, Sun Ching Ling asks to join the Communist Party, but receives a telling reply from her old friend, Zhou Enlai. He said, we have millions of Communist Party members, but we have only one Sun Ching Ling, only one Madam Sun Yat-sen. Chiang Kai-shek spends part of the gold reserves that he took with him from China to manipulate American public opinion. For a time, America views Chiang Kai-shek's island state of Taiwan as an anti-communist fort. Mei Ling is dispatched on numerous occasions to warn of the menace of the communists and plead for additional help for that final return home to mainland China. Her trips to America become less wish list and more wishful thinking. Do you have any idea of when that invasion will come? I don't see how you can call it an invasion because you invade something that doesn't belong to you. Now, mainland China is our home. We are going back home. We don't invade it. It is not a foreign nation. It is not a foreign land. But it is a land about to undergo the most extraordinary mass movement of the 20th century. Mao launches the great proletariat cultural revolution. He unleashes the young people of China to go out and destroy the four olds. Old thinking, old customs, old habits, and old culture. Red Guards turn on anyone or anything associated with the West, destroying what they can, denouncing whomever they will. Sun Ching Ling, who said she did not really trust any politician except her husband, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, is condemned for her bourgeois ways, her traitorous relatives. The Red Guards ransack her home and desecrate her parents' tomb. Only Cho and Lai's intervention saves her from public humiliation and probably death. But nothing can stop the leukemia coursing through her body. 
Ching Ling's eldest sister is also diagnosed with cancer. After her husband, H.H. H. Kung, dies, she lives in seclusion in their mansion just outside of New York City. Here, the richest self-made woman in Chinese history quietly passes away at the age of 85. For the only Sung sister who was not at any time the first lady of China, Ai Ling's death barely gets a mention in the press. The island of Taiwan mourns the death of its generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek, the man who once ruled the most populous country in the world and lost it. With Chiang Kai-shek's death, his widow Mei Ling moves to where she disappears into virtual obscurity. <laughs> On occasion, Mei Ling re-emerges as a specter haunting the stage. The woman who had year after year been chosen by the American people as one of the most respected women in the world is now forgotten by the American public. with arthritis and dying with leukemia. Ching Ling still manages to attend ceremonial meetings. Before her death in 1981, she spends her days re-screening her favorite movies. The one film that she watches over and over again is Gone with the Wind. The movie recounts the epic story of a disastrous civil war, of tragic loss, of romance, and of great courage. Perhaps it brings back memories for her. Memories of those happy, carefree times when the sisters were all together in the magnolia-scented southern state of Georgia, young and innocent, when the world was fresh, before the time of their revolution, before the time of wealth, of power, of corruption, betrayal, and tragedy. Before Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Before Madame Sun Yat-sen. Before Madame H. H. Kung. A time when they were simply Ai Ling, Ching Ling, Mei Ling. The Soong sisters. In the fall of 1996, Mei Ling, at 98, is reported living in New York City.